Hi, I'm Dr. Wicklein. I'm here to talk to you today about mitigating the post-total knee arthroplasty tsunami. Uh, this is my term for it, but if you look at the picture here, you can see the, the young woman down here. She's thinking about getting her knee fixed, and you can see what, what really I think what most patients see, which is this, this overwhelming fear of what's going to happen. And if you look at the top here, you can see the standard inflammation rate for total knee, and hopefully with a 32 to 54 percent reduction in swelling, the, the wave is not as uh, scary uh, as the top wave there. So again, we're going to talk today uh, about mitigating uh, the post-op swelling. So who is your ultimate customer? Uh, it's the patient. In this case, a 64-year-old avid golfer. What does the patient want with total joint arthroplasty? Well, they want five things in my experience. They want arthritic pain uh, alleviation, improved function and being able to walk better, Minimal and no pain after surgery, even though that might be a little unrealistic. They want no complications and they're particularly scared of infection. And really, the, the thing I hear all the time, Doc, what's my recovery? I want the quickest possible recovery. You know, the golf league needs me back. So we need to understand uh, what patients are going through. And so look at this paper here from 2021. 58% of patients really fear uh, the pain that they're going to experience after surgery and during that uh, post-op physical therapy and 18% wonder if they're ever going to be able to get back to regular walking. So managing swelling in my mind speeds recovery. And we're going to show you uh, my entire uh, thought process from 2013 to now. So two factors led me to look at swelling. Uh, the first is that I personally had several knee arthro uh, arthroscopies. The first one I behaved, I did very little walking, I elevated and I iced, and I was back to the operating room in three days. So the second one, I thought I knew better I could beat the odds, so I thought I could get away with a little more. So right after surgery, I got a haircut. I had a haircut, uh, I had hair back then. Uh, I brought some fencing, and then I went to a party. The very next day, my knee was extraordinarily painful. Uh, in fact, it was so painful that I had to go to my office, and then after draining 120 cc's of blood out of my knee, I could suddenly walk again, and uh, my range of motion turned. So <clears throat> I saw the same kind of thing with my patients. Uh, those patients who lived up north, uh, I live in a, a small town, a lot of my patients live up north in the Adirondack Park, they don't have access to physical therapy and they said, hey Wickline, just show me, show me the simple exercises that I can do to get through this because my, my the hospital therapist gave me 20 exercises to do and I'll be honest, I'm not going to get that done. And so I showed them the four or five exercises and sure enough those patients came back to me at three weeks with better range of motion and uh, less manipulation rate compared to the patients at the time who went to inpatient rehab and had three hours of therapy a day. And patients don't like swelling. We've all heard this. It feels tight. It feels like there's a rubber band around my knee or a vice. We know that swelling leads to something called AMI, arthrogenic muscle inhibition. Essentially, the knee gives way frequently. And if, in fact, I'm sure you've heard this uh, from your patients. Hey, doc, my knee has given out a couple times. Is that normal? And we, lastly, we know that fluid does not compress. The greater the swelling, the lower the range of motion. And I've got some great slides that finally prove this uh, at the end of this talk. So a couple of things I tell my uh, uh, patients as well as uh, visiting surgeons about, I call them the three pain spikes. I think that we all know the first two pain spikes. That's when the, the periarticular block wears off at 24 to 36 hours. And then also again at 72 hours when that long acting block, whatever you, your choice is, wears off. But the third pain spike is that phone call we all get about a week after surgery when the patient calls saying, oh my gosh, my pain is unbearable. What happened? I was doing great. And if you don't mitigate that or if you don't tell the patient about it ahead of time, I can guarantee you they're going to worry that something's wrong even when you order that, that negative duplex. They're going to believe that something is wrong when in fact it's the actual normal swelling curve, which we're going to show you. So in 2020, my team uh, published the first uh, of uh, several uh, research projects that I've been working on uh, with some important results. One, 86% of my patients uh, use 10 opioid pills or fewer from recovery room through 90 days post-op. And two, 85% of patients required no formal therapy. And you can see uh, that the mean flexion was pretty good. Three weeks, 109 degrees, and at six weeks, 115 degrees. And so our results are really premised on one main concept, that swelling causes pain and retards recovery. So I set out to further improve recovery by determining what else could be done to reduce swelling. So here are all the factors over the last decade that I've come up with that, that may uh, improve post-op swelling. Kinematic alignment, uh, minimizing ligamentous uh, releases, greater post-op stability both anterior-posterior and medial-lateral, 
tourniquet free, decreasing a step count, icing and elevation, we're still working on this, but I have my own specific protocol. Whether or not uh, certain compression stockings make a difference, and we're working on that currently. Uh, intraarticular medications or lavages or cauterization, specific therapy protocols, which we'll go over. What's the TXA, uh, tranexamic acid regimen? How about other perioperative medications or supplements like bioflavonoids? Uh, branch chain amino acid uh, supplementation, that's uh, been shown to reduce uh, IL-6 uh, and other uh, inflammatory markers. Uh, keeping the knee flexed for up to six hours post-op. Sequential compression devices, uh, electrical stim uh, devices that uh, patients can wear that help uh, provide vascular pumping and manual lymphatic uh, drainage are all the different ways that I've thought of over the last decade that may improve uh, patients' uh, post-op recovery. So in my 2020 paper, I, I look back and what, what are the things that I had done uh, to reduce swelling? Well, number one, we no tourniquet. Number two, icing and elevating for 40 minutes an hour while awake for the first two weeks. Number three, uh, I have the specific therapy protocol, which is the same as that we're going to describe in this newest study. And my patients, I, all, I gave them all low-dose prednisone as long as they were not insulin-dependent diabetics and uh, uh, NSAID like silicoxib or meloxicam. Uh, when the patient had no contraindications. That study did not have step count parameters, did not use kinematic alignment or medial pivot knee, had frequent MCL releasing uh, for balancing, and used a dilute uh, sterile iodine uh, lavage for infection prevention. Brian Lloyd did this uh, amazing uh, uh, paper uh, back in 2018, uh, published in the Journal of Disability and Rehabilitation, we showed that there was a, a fair amount of swelling uh, at uh, day seven. Again, that's where that, that uh, third pain spike comes. And if you look at the 90th percentile down to the 10th percentile, there was a range of 46 to 22% swelling with the mean range being 34%. So in my baseline uh, protocol currently, uh, in, in this next study that we're gonna talk about, we looked at uh, patients, that every patient had pre-op and post-op oral tranexamic acid of about 1300 milligrams. Uh, uh, not about, but exactly. Uh, they had kinematic alignment with no MCL release and a medial pivot implant to provide better AP stability. I, again, used my specific therapy protocol, which has no strengthening for the first six weeks. And again, it's a home-based therapy protocol. My patients were instructed to follow a weekly step count, which I co-developed with uh, another surgeon uh, colleague from Florida, Mandume Karina, uh, which we'll, we'll discuss. Ice and elevation for 40 minutes an hour while awake for the first two weeks, again, using a simple ice packs and a standardized foam pillow, no uh, motorized cooling or compression devices. The post-op meds typically included silicoxib or meloxicam, prednisone, acetaminophen, aspirin, uh, gabapentin, and tramadol. And again, no uh, compressive device or stocking like a TED or uh, um, any other kind of compressive device. And again, a sterile dilute iodine lavage for three minutes uh, uh, based off uh, Jay Parvizi's work. Uh, even though there is some data that suggests this is tissue toxic, that was the uh, baseline protocol. So here's my therapy protocol over the last 3,000 total knee arthroplasty patients. I have patients walk hourly uh, while awake, five to 10 steps per hour to prevent blood clot and pneumonia, and I discourage extra walking. I have them do 10 ankle pumps per hour, at least uh, uh, 10, they can do more of that. And again, 10 to 14 times a day. I have them sit in a chair and bring the leg back as far as they can and then scoot their butt forward. So again, a, a flexion movement. And then I have them place their foot up on a small step stool and again, uh, uh, gently, uh, passively extend the knee, trying to get full extension. And lastly, I have them do 10 uh, uh, minute heel hangs three times a day. The step count, which again I developed with my colleague, Dr. Mandume Makarina, this is what we recommend to patients. The first week, 750 steps or less per day. Second week, less than 1,200 steps a day. Third week, 2,000 steps and so forth, as you can see in this slide. After six weeks, we tell patients they can try to increase their steps about 1,000 steps per day per week. So week seven would be 5,500 and so forth. And this seems to cover about 90% of patients. I can tell you uh, patients love having this direction. This has been very, very helpful in, in explaining to patients why they're suddenly having a setback. Patients just look at their watch and say, oh, I understand why I'm having uh, trouble tonight or I'm struggling. And I wanna ask you as a patient or as a surgeon, if you sprain your ankle badly, do you walk extra to make it heal faster? We all know the answer to this. I know as a teenager, you, you learn this uh, um, solution, right? You sprain your ankle playing basketball, you stay off of it for a week or two. Uh, but you do need to walk a little bit to prevent pneumonia and blood clot. 
So again, I believe that swelling leads to significant to, uh, morbidity post-op. And uh, my older surgeons uh, who uh, my age or older, you may recall that when we used to do press fit total hips, uh, we would make those patients non-weight bearing uh, for six weeks. And it was amazing how quickly their pain uh, improved because they stayed off the leg and they, they basically had to minimize their steps. And so again, I did a separate pilot study using a uh, Fitbit. And so you can see this patient, active male patient, 71 years old. You can see the 10,000 step line here. He's all over the place pre-op, but look post-op. He's all over the place post-op. He did not listen. So at two weeks post-op, while many surgeons think this is a great result at two weeks post-op, six to 100 degrees with no therapy, no opioids, I tell that patient they're in trouble actually. They did not follow the step count and I give them a B grade. However, you look at this patient, 75 year old female, again, very active preoperatively, over 10,000 steps many times uh, before surgery. Look at what she did post-op. She listened to my protocol. She did exactly what I told her. And look at her range of motion at two weeks. Again, no PT, no opioids, but two to 117 degrees, almost 20 degrees of extra motion uh, compared to the other patient. So clearly following the step protocol made a difference, at least in this case. We're gonna show you some regression analysis uh, that again, I think really proves this. So my next step was to decide how else I might change the post-op swelling curve. Having implemented reduced ligament disruption with a kinematic alignment, I felt it was time to turn to another uh, potential area for swelling reduction, and that's to look at intraoperative lavages or, and treatments or cauterization. So at that time, uh, I, I was introduced to a product that would help reduce uh, biofilm, uh, and this product is called uh, Experience. Uh, and that product works through chelating metal ions that bind to the biofilm polymers together and lyses uh, bacteria and fungi at the same time. And it's all done through this uh, matrix metalloproteinase uh, pathway. And this is important because that pathway also is responsible uh, for reducing inflammation, which we're going to see in the next slide. So I applied uh, for and was granted an investigative sponsored uh, research grant comparing a dilute iodine lavage to the experienced product. So again, the experienced product has these anti-inflammatory uh, effects uh, by binding uh, to these metal proteins. And you can see on the right-hand side, uh, the matrix metalloproteinase looks what, what, what happens. You get uh, inactivation of cytokines, you know, IL-1. Uh, you get uh, a significant reduction in the inflammatory pathway. So even though I, I didn't really believe that this simple lavage was going to make a big difference uh, when we measured it, the company felt it would and uh, were willing to uh, uh, support this. Our pilot study was my protocol uh, plus this anti-inflammatory bactericidal wash uh, compared to the sterile iodine lavage. So again, we used 60 patients. I made sure that these patients lived within a 20 minute radius of the office and they were consented to the study uh, so that they could come in multiple times post-operatively because it is a hassle. And again, I I'm trying to have patients avoid their extra steps uh, and uh, long drives coming into the office. So it did take us a little while to get enough patients who were in that uh, um, uh, geographic circumference, uh, but we got 30 patients in both sets. All patients were measured preoperatively as well as post-op at 48 to 72 hours, and again at days uh, 7, 14, 21, 42. They were all measured using the same uh, bioimpedance uh, assessment device, the RJL Quantum, Quantum Legacy, as the, uh, exactly the same device as per the Lloyd uh, reference graph paper. All patients had the same education booklet and followed the same baseline protocol, the only uh, change being the intraoperative lavage. So this is a busy slide. Uh, so as you can see, we've got the uh, uh, Brian Lloyd data, which is uh, the uh, dotted lines. The top dotted line is the 90th percentile, the highest swelling. So at day seven, 46% more swelling. Uh, and the, the bottom uh, line is the lowest to 10th percentile of his data, 22% swelling at day seven. And the middle line is 34%. That's the mean. And you can see the red line is my personal baseline protocol using the iodine. Uh, and then the yellow line is the uh, experience, again, using my protocol. And you can see that uh, here, there is a significant reduction from day seven to 21. These results were all significantly better than the reference data with the inflammation curves lying below the 10th percentile inflammation line at multiple time points. So again, another data showing decreased inflammation using the experience product uh, compared to the iodine. So the inflammation with experience was statistically significantly less than with iodine uh, on day 14. In addition, we saw increased range of motion using uh, the experienced product compared to my uh, uh, baseline protocol using the iodine. Uh, and again, you can see it was statistically significant on day uh, 
21 and also at day uh, seven, and there was signal you know, nearing significance at both uh, days two and at day 14, and this is for range of motion. We saw a signal for less pain with experience compared to iodine, uh, so we, uh, again, we need a larger study to, uh, to see if this uh, really holds out. We saw significantly decreased opioid usage when using the Experience product compared to the uh, uh, beta iodine, iodine control. Again, uh, this was signal uh, showing that there may be significance with a higher uh, volume uh, or number of patients. And that the half-life for the opioid use was 10 days less with the Experience than with iodine. We saw a statistical significance with a quicker return to unassisted walking using the Experience product with iodine. And again, uh, this suggests to me that there's less inflammation. And now we're going to look at that. We've got the um, regression analysis. So we look at the influence of inflammation on range of motion. And here you can see in this graph that as inflammation increases, uh, range of motion decreases. And again, as expected, as inflammation increases, pain increases. Uh, again, that's not really a surprise to us, but we actually have data now to prove that. Uh, in addition, uh, as the inflammation increases, again, the device usage increases. So again, a swollen leg makes it harder to walk. You're going to use an assistive device longer. And no surprise, if you have increased pain, you have increased swelling, and you need more assistive devices, you're probably going to use more opioids. So sure enough, more opioid usage as inflammation increases. So in summary, in this small pilot study, using a biofilm reducing technology, which has anti-inflammatory properties, we saw some significant results. Most importantly, we saw reduced inflammation uh, within 14 days. In fact, 32 to 54% lower than the mean that was published in the Lloyd paper. Both groups performed better than uh, the Lloyd paper in terms of swelling at day seven, and the experienced group dropped below the 90th percentile by day 14. We believe this is the lowest published uh, inflammation rate in the country, and we are working on getting uh, a manuscript out uh, later this fall. We know that lower inflammation now uh, accounts for increased range of motion within seven days, lower reported pain, less opioid usage, and a faster return to unassisted mobility. So the next step uh, for our program is testing a new multimodal protocol. So our team has another pilot study currently underway using uh, uh, my baseline protocol, again without the iodine lavage, uh, using the Experience anti-inflammatory bactericidal lavage instead and using extended TXA, as well as a patented innovative uh, compression stocking and a motorized uh, cold water uh, cooling device with a low compression mode. I personally believe we can get another 7% lower than where we are now. So our 2024 research goal uh, is to reach out to uh, others uh, interested in this uh, problem, right? We, none of us want our patients to face that tsunami like in that very first uh, title page. So despite the small sample size, we found statistically a significant swelling reduction at several time points, and other time points were close to reaching significance. So again, my personal swelling numbers are pretty low, so uh, using my baseline protocol, we were still able to see significance at some time points. So therefore, I propose a multi-center study looking at each of the variables I, I've outlined. Uh, and so if you have interest in taking part in further research, there's a link here at the bottom of this uh, presentation uh, to reach out to us because uh, again, I really think this is a way for us to, re to reduce opioids and to get faster recovery for our patients, which is really what they're looking for. Thank you very much for this very lengthy and uh, long-winded uh, 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 presentation. Uh, I apologize, that's just the way I am. Thanks.